Sean Caulfield in the conversation with Paul Colwell. Before we do that, the customary announcement regarding fire. There is no drill. It is an alarm. It's real. And it's an alarm. What we do is we go out these doors, we turn right, we turn left, we go down the stairs and we assemble outside tech room. So that's that housekeeping bit over with. So, welcome to the third in the series of conversations with prominent printmakers, generously supported by the journal Print Quarterly. Uh, and welcome especially to members of the board who are in the audience. We are delighted that Print Quarterly have announced that they will continue to support this uh, event for further years, and we're very grateful for that. The background of this event is that over a number of years, Paul Caldwell, my colleague, has staged a public conversation with artists for whom printmaking plays a key role in their practice. These conversations have included Thomas, Thomas Kilper, Christiana Baumgartner, Baumgartner, Jim Dine, and following the support of Print Quarterly, Christopher Lebron, and last year, William Kendridge. We are delighted this year to welcome Sean Caulfield. Sean Caulfield was born in Rhode Island, USA. He is a Centennial Professor in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Alberta in Canada. He is a leading figure within printmaking, working across a broad range of media, from intimate mentor tints through to large-scale relief prints and installations. He has exhibited his work extensively throughout Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan, and has received numerous grants and awards, including the Triennial, Triennial Prize at the second Bangkok Triennial International Print and Drawing Ex Exhibition, Bangkok, SSHRC Dissemination Grant, Canadian Stem Cell Network Impact Grant, SH, SSHRC Fine Arts Creation Grant, and a, and a Canada Council travel grant. His work is in numerous co public and private collections, including Houghton Library, Harvard University, Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, Blanton Museum of Art in Texas. Caulfield's creative research involved the production of artists' books, prints, drawings, and installations that explore the impact of technology on the environment and our bodies. Specifically, he's interested in creating visual images that blur boundaries between the biological and the technological, the organic and the mechanical, which challenge viewers to consider the, the implications of this merging. Most recently, the exhibition and resulting publication, Printmaking in the Anthropocene, Visual Research from the University of Alberta, was co-organized by Paul Field and Joan Greer as part of a broader initiative entitled Change for Climate, Art for Change, to coincide with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Cities and Climate Change Science Conference held in Edmonton, Alberta in March 2018. My colleague Paul Colwell is an artist, professor in fine art at the University of the Arts London, and a member of the editorial board of the journal Print Quarter. He has recently been awarded an HSC network grant for an interdisciplinary project exploring how we picture the invisible, and is working towards an exhibition of new work for the Sir John Stones Museum in London for July 2019. It's going to be a very special evening, and thank you both. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, can you all hear me? Is it okay? Oh, well, well, welcome, everyone. This is, um, I feel a little bit, those of you that are old enough to remember, I feel a little bit like Val Dunigan in this chair, and uh, that's why I've taken my sweater off, because I didn't want to sort of cement that image in your mind. Um, it's an enormous pleasure for me to have this opportunity to talk with Sean in front, in front of you. And um, basically the, the format will be that we will engage in conversation for the next 45, 50 minutes, then uh, a period of questions and answers, Q&A, and then we'd be delighted if you join us for a drink and informal meeting afterwards. Um, if I notice that you're all looking around at the drinks too early on, and I know that I've done my job badly. Um, so, Sean, welcome to Chelsea College of Art and to the University of the Arts. And um, I thought it would be very interesting if you could actually start off. Uh, we, we, you selected this sort of picture of Canada, of the oil fields, and maybe this is a good point to start about your um, 
or your life in Canada and, and some of the background of your work. Sure. Um, before I do that, just briefly, I want to say thank you for this opportunity to come here. It's a real pleasure. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to start with this because my father, I was born in the U.S., my, my father's from the U.S., my mother's as well, but we moved <coughs> to Canada when I was quite young to work in, and my father worked in oil and gas. And so he was an engineer, geophysicist, and a lot of my youth I was surrounded by uh, industry, um, industrial objects. And to me this is a, it was a kind of common scene you'll see in Alberta. Uh, as many of you may know, Alberta's um, massive, part of its economy is oil and gas. And many of you may know one of its biggest uh, resources is, is the oil sands or tar sands depending on your perspective. So this was a big part of my life. And just to end, I would say uh, it's interesting because my oldest brother is still in this sector. Um, so when I think about questions around the environment, it's, it's an interesting uh, to be kind of embedded in that. I mean, I think one of the interesting things which I think that we can talk about as we go along is the fact that, uh, you know, th there is this, uh, your work takes on the kind of complexity of both the economic importance of oil and gas to the region and the wider issues of global warming and res natural resources and things like that. Um, now, these are two of your early, very small mezzotints and yes, etchings. Yeah. So I started off, I mean, a lot of my uh, earlier work was quite small and intimate. Uh, it's sort of grown over the years. Um, it's a bit hard to see in the screen, but uh, they're uh, mezzotint. This one's pure mezzotint, and this is the combination of Italian and mezzotint. But at the time, I had a kind of a, I guess you might say, simple creative methodology. I would walk in the kind of landscape I just showed, or in kind of urban, rural spaces, go back to my studio and draw from memory. And a lot of what I was interested in is this, this kind of exchange between the organic and the mechanical, and the of transitions I was seeing in the environment. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of not maybe as overtly about the environment, maybe more quiet, introspective works, mm -hmm. but it was the start of a kind of and, and very much centered around drawing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah which and continues to be yeah. Yeah, And um, I suppose, you know, then let's go on to the Masters um, at the University of Alberta, and also the, you know, some of your in early influences the tutors that were working there. I wonder if you could say something about th this, you know, particular group of artists. That sure, I, uh, it's great to share this. This is uh, three of the artists I'm going to show were instrumental in starting the program at the University of Alberta. Um, and I'd also like to take a moment to say that uh, some of my students are here from Canada. It just so happens that they're on a school trip, so welcome. <laughs> That's great. Uh, or some of you have seen. So this is Walter. You, you better get good grades. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, this is Walter Jules' work, and I guess what I would say broadly about my experience as an undergrad, which I hope I've carried forward in my own practice and hopefully in, in teaching, is they did stress a kind of tension or balance between uh, learning some, you know, have a deeper understanding of technique and appreciation of material and uh, but at the same time not being caught by that, mm. if that makes sense, mm. and pushing that understanding to maybe unexpected places. Mm. So this is one of Walter Jewell's work. Um, this is Liz Ingram. Uh, this is a large digital work, I think in an exhibition in Germany. Uh, and then Lyndall Osborne, who actually was my uh, MFA supervisor, and she's moved from print into more sculptural work, uh, but even now I feel like I share a sensibility with her. Yeah. So, so there's this mixture between the experimental and the kind of traditional craft skills that you, yes. you seem to be yeah. getting. Yeah. yeah, it was, and so I found that was a really rich uh, undergrad and graduate experience. Yeah. And there was this resource, the Print Study Center. Yeah, so I wanted to sh share this because uh, Edmonton's a reasonably big city, there's a million people, but we are, we're not London, mm. and so having uh, these kinds of collections were really important to my mm. underground experience, being able to be exposed directly to prints. And they were, uh, I think, 
outstanding in terms of collecting prints from around the world. So it, it allowed for a kind of exposure to a wide network. And, and this was generally used as a teaching resource? Yeah, every, every class goes up, uses it, uh, it was hugely beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, and was super impactful in the yeah. Because also, I, I've, I've always thought that, that in many ways, printmaking suffers more than any other, uh, any other art form in reproduction. Because if someone has taken so much effort to choose a means of reproduction, to make an image, mm -hmm. and then it's reproduced for color life, yeah. um, something very important gets lost. Absolutely. You know? yeah, yeah. I mean, scale, um, intensity of the yeah. graphic mark, um, materiality, mm -hmm. all for sure. And so I know when I'm teaching, and I use this, I feel like I can sense the students kind of mm -hmm. opening up just mm -hmm. having seen the real work. Right? Yeah. And there's also the evidence of in the work, which actually enables the student to understand how something's made. For sure, and I, that happens, and I think also that great moment when an uh, awareness around form and content and method mm. makes sense, mm. right? Uh, why did they choose that particular method mm. and this kind of merging of form and content? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And we, you, you picked out these two images from the collection. Yeah, so this is Andre Mechanic, whose work I've always admired, and this is Ryoji Ikeda. Um, and I, the other thing that kind of dovetailed with the print study collection is they worked hard to bring artists in as visiting artists. Often some would stay for two or three weeks. And this, uh, Ikeda's work, who's, who was a professor at Musashino Art University in Tokyo, is interesting because the bottom part is uh, photo etching from Emerson, and the top part is uh, his studio in Hokkaido. And so the work kind of represents mm -hmm. this emerging. And you can see in the bottom, I don't know if you can sense this, but you see ice pad, lily pads forming on the ice. Mm -hmm. So this is late fall and a river is beginning mm -hmm. to spring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, as happens to all students, you left university. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. And, um, and this was an open access studio that you worked at? Yeah, so I wanted to, well, I wanted to share this for a number of reasons. One was, um, I don't know if this is unusual, but for me, after my finishing my BFA, I found it to be a difficult year. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so financially it was challenging, yeah. and moving from this environment of, of making work all mm -hmm. the time to having to balance work, making money mm -hmm. in your own work. So it was challenging, and so, uh, this is SNAP for short, was hugely beneficial, gave me a place to work, but also community. And so for emerging artists, I think this kind of center is essential. Mm. Um, the other reason I want to share it though for artists or emerging artists in the, in the audience, uh, there's a whole network of these across Canada, mm. and a lot of them have residencies, and mm. so it's a great way to bring international people. Or if you're interested in coming to Canada, there's a number mm. of these across and do they provide, is there accommodation attached to Yeah, a lot of them, mm -hmm. well, almost all of them provide funding. Mm -hmm. uh, some have accommodation, some don't. Oops. Oh, maybe it was that. Um, good. Oh, I don't think oh there we go. Oh, we're back. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. no? Um, Seems to be this wire. The back. Hopefully we're okay. Shall I? Let's try that. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All that. Yeah. So some of them provide funding, and again, uh, I would certainly encourage you people are interested to. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then you know, I mean, I do like a bit of romance, and um, you met you met an artist. In Japan, yes. and um, we've been together ever since, yes. which is always good to hear. Um, and you, you've had a very kind of close working relationship. Yeah. So this is Aki oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Akiko Taniguchi's work. Uh, so uh, we've been together, yes, 20 years. Um, and I think you can see we also share maybe a sensibility in terms mm -hmm. of visual language. Um, 
And so we've never directly collaborated, but you know, when you work mm -hmm. in the studio with someone, it becomes a kind of collaborative mm -hmm. experience. And so I'm very grateful for yeah. that um, support. Yeah. But the, the description of your studio is quite small. Yeah, well, initially, when I first met her, she had a studio in Tokyo that, yeah. um, I don't know if anyone's worked or been to Tokyo, but the studio, her, it was her apartment, and we lived and printed and mm. all of this tiny little space. So that was a really interesting experience mm. to see how you could make work in such a tiny yeah. quarter. We've since uh, expanded that. Yeah. <laughs> bigger studio now. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And, um, and this is an image you've sort of selected from, um, you know, Japan, which, in a way, uh, opens up a lot of the things that you you're going to go on to do. Yes. So I don't know. Maybe some of you have been to this famous uh, temple shrine in uh, near Hiroshima. Uh, incredible place. And for me, it was quite a transformative experience. And for all kinds of reasons. One was the kind of architectural. Mm -hmm. um, at the one, it, what's interesting about this space for me architecturally is it's intimate but expansive at the same time, which mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the use of wood mm -hmm. and carving, the use of carving that became sculptural mm -hmm. but was imaged simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I think that was something that was really interesting. And also, I think something that's common in uh, <coughs> Buddhist art, to my mind anyway, I'm not an expert, but um, a use of material and image that kind of fluctuates. So, on the one hand, you see it as wood, on the other hand, it becomes image. And that's common in other traditions as well, but that kind of um, fluctuation of image and, and material uh, is very interesting to me. Yeah. But you've also got the paper being actually pasted onto the surfaces as well. Yeah, that's right. Which is something you go on to yes, explore to great, to great effect. And uh, and I suppose in a way this leads on to the way that you've your your printmaking has gradually developed away from this sort of you know small intimate mezzotint uh, kind of interior <coughs> space to something sort of much more public, yes. uh, breaking away from the frame, breaking away from the uh, the the limitations of the press. Um, and um, so in this build-up, I think it's sort of you know, very interesting the way that, you know, that this, this um, Dura that you, you've selected, this wonderful Dura, which although is quite small, is very epic in terms of the way one reads it as an image. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why I selected it. I mean, very famous work, we're all familiar with it. Um, but exactly that, I and mean, I think when we see Duras, one of the things that's amazing about them is they're intimate, but they exactly as you said, mm -hmm. they have this extensive quality mm -hmm. um, and you get enveloped by them, right? Mm -hmm. So that I think is interesting. Obviously there's this notion that it's a woodcut and this way woodcut has been reused over mm -hmm. time is of interest as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the period is of interest as, as many of you know, uh, at the time, many, many people thought 1500 would be the end of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so this theme of the apocalypse and thinking about that then and now The world actually ends in March with Brexit. I <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's another matter. I didn't want to go into that. Yeah. But I think it's also <laughs> interesting that you go from you know this, which is sort of you know the, the for most of us, most of us would be regarded as sort of the, you know the pinnacle of of wood engraving, to you know very an image from very popular culture. Yeah. So I don't know if people are familiar with Charles Burns. He's a wonderful graphic artist, I think, and the novel Black Hole is, is terrific. So yeah, I'm very interested in contemporary graphic novels and the connection between uh, that longer history we saw and this, uh, an image like this, which, uh, you know, it's, on the one hand, it has a popular feel, but many of the links to that mm -hmm. really good work is kind of like, yeah. And then you up your scale. Yes. So this is one of the uh, first large woodcut uh, done. Um, that golden color is because it's printed on gompi, so you're probably familiar with the Japanese paper gompi. And um, it's 82 inches by 72 inches. Um, 
And so drawing on a lot of things I've been talking about already, this interest in um, materiality of wood, uh, interest in the history of, of woodcut and, and artists like, like Durer. But then thinking about uh, the situation in Alberta, the rapid change in, in the landscape because of resource extraction, the challenging issues that come up because of that. On the one hand, producing a tremendous amount of wealth. On the other hand, long-term questions come up. Um, and at the time, there was a number of uh, tailing ponds still. This is, these are <coughs> things that are containing um, toxins from mines. And so that was on my mind. And then when you come to ex exhibit them, you, you return to that idea of the Buddhist temple. And these are pasted on, onto the walls. That's right. So uh, I'm doing direct paste up on the gallery wall. Sometimes I'll show them as loose sheets, mm -hmm. but I prefer to show them this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of reasons that I think it's interesting, but primarily it gives it, I think, a stronger graphic mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's interesting, it kind of becomes part of the gallery wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is an open installation. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of the scale. And it also means you do, you're not looking through the reflective glass. That's right. You get a much more direct experience yeah. of the print, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Yeah. And you also sort of take it actually out in the streets as well. Yeah. In these. Yeah, these actually, if you go back to the other one, I think there's something interesting. I'm, I think this is a great opportunity about the way, you know, working with pay stubs. Um, and um, also speaks to how one of the great benefits of print, you know, the capacity to, to see works and other mm -hmm. variables so easily. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I'm drawn to print, so you can show it in the gallery and then in mm -hmm. this context. The reason I wanted to go back is, I think it's important to note the police car in the background. Um, it got sorted out. But, um, you know, the public space and these challenges that come up, um, I did have permission, but, uh, you know, people, on one hand they embrace it, and on the other hand there's these funny challenges that come out in public spaces. Yeah. But, but you also feel that, you know, because of your, um, you know, the, the content of your work, there is a, a kind of an obligation on your behalf to get this material out, to reach a public yeah. beyond... An art gallery. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I'm, obviously art galleries and museums are tremendous resources and important, and I would never you know, not want them. But, uh, you know, looking for other ways to reach public mm -hmm. is, is so important. And again, I think something that print is uniquely positioned mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the challenges, of course, is how, how can you do that and still envision a work that functions? Yeah. Uh, and that's, of course, an interesting creative challenge. Mm -hmm. It's also very exciting about you know the whole idea of the multiple that something could be simultaneously in such different Context. conditions and yeah. places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then w was this in the underground? Or? Yeah. So this is in our LRT station, and um, so again, a great a lot of people see it. A lot of people can can. And one thing that I found interesting, I thought for sure it was going to be destroyed. Like no question, but nobody touched it. It was very interesting to me. And uh, how long was that up for? Three months. Oh. Yeah. Because so it actually looks rather good with the times. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of grid. Yeah, well, and I was surprised how well the paste ups worked with the size. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in a way, fire damp takes those ideas into the idea of uh, installation. Yes. And I mean, was this was this a big step forward? And I suppose one of the things is to what extent this is an amalgam of discrete works, or whether this is an installation that is conceived of as one whole statement. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this work, it, it was interesting for me to do because I had been doing these public pay stuffs, and I thought about kind of now bringing it back into the gallery. Mm -hmm. And another thing I should acknowledge is collaboration. Um, I don't have any images of this, but throughout some of this process, I collaborated with a sculptor, and he had worked, he, Royden Mills is his name, and he worked at quite a large scale, and I think that dialogue helped me to sort of think through mm -hmm. changing scale and also thinking about space differently. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but to answer your question more directly, I, I think I was, maybe go to the next slide, yeah, trying to imagine uh, a situation where I could use the whole wall and sort of see it as a piece. Um, but at the same time, I mean, maybe going back to that analogy of, of thinking of the Buddhist temple, that it was maybe in flux a little bit, mm. that it's the whole piece, but it's not, if that makes sense. But you're exhibiting the actual blocks now. Yeah, so in this case, it's a combination of actual blocks mm. and paste ups. Mm. So there's a combination of both mm. uh, the matrix and the printing. And, and that gets followed through in a much more evident way in um, Dead Weight. Yes. So this is a piece where I was very much thinking about um, some of these questions about environmental change uh, and a little bit more in the context of water. And one of the things that's coming up a lot in our province is a desire to get more oil to the coast. We don't have enough pipeline capacity. It's a huge economic issue. There's, of course, strong debates on both sides, very polarized. And so this image of a boat I, was interesting to me for that reason. Mm -hmm. But in this case, yeah, I began to think about, uh, well, because some of these large blocks I was actually carving on the floor mm -hmm. of my studio, I began to sort of see the floor as an interesting mm -hmm. opportunity. So this is carved uh, maple blocks. Uh, and then I, I thought it could be interesting if the actual graphic language meta sculptural. I mean, I think it's intriguing, the, you know, the, the, the way the uh, the waves around the boat are rendered, you know, in, in, in very much kind of graphic style, aren't they? Yeah, and again, maybe going back to this idea of putting the viewer in a position of, of flux, mm -hmm. um, recognizing image, material, object, all simultaneously. I mean, it's a very disturbing work. I mean, it, it has some of the... Um, Connotations of Kiefer mm -hmm. uh, with some of his installations, and there's um, it's very doomly. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's an interesting question to me is how we think about crisis and mm. loss and catastrophe as a society, and what role art can maybe play mm. in helping us think through those things. Um, and I, I hope that maybe in making works that reflect on some of that, it's actually a way for people to talk about these anxieties mm -hmm. and um, in a more nuanced way. I don't know if that's making sense, but... Mm. Yes, because there's, there's something um, that you wrote uh, and that I thought was very strong in this, this front. Um, um, can I quote oh, you? please. Perhaps this is one. Um, perhaps this is one vital role that art can play in re in relation to environmental discourse, articulating multivalent and contradictory feelings that range from anxiety and despair to hope and empowerment. To my mind, this is particularly important as one of the greatest challenges we face in addressing environmental problems is the tendency for those issues to polarize and divide society stifling productive dialogue and meaningful action. I thought that's very eloquent. Well, I think, you know, it, it gets back to, you know, my brothers and their own business, right? Yeah. And we have dialogue, and mm -hmm. he's just trying to raise his family. Mm -hmm. So th these tensions are really, you know, mm -hmm. very real in kind of my daily life, you know. I, I'd like to sort of talk to you a little bit um, uh, about the way that research is embedded within your practice. Because, you know, over the years you've been engaged in a number of projects and we'll look at some of those as we um, uh, go along. But um, I wonder if you could say something about what, what research through practice means means to you. Um, sure. Uh, starting with this, uh, this is my <coughs> brother. Hmm. He's not an oil, but in, he's an academic, and I'm doing a little uh, shameless promotion for his Netflix TV show, please mm -hmm. watch it. Uh, but he does a lot, he's in health law, he does a lot of work up around 
uh, health ethics. And one of the things he's increasingly interested in is the role popular culture has in forming it, opinions around health. And I think this is, translates into lots of other areas. But I, I wanted to start with this because he and I began to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. And he's introduced me to some of the larger interdisciplinary projects. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things we, we, one of the first ones we did was a large interdisciplinary project that looked at technology in the body. Mm -hmm. And that led to a whole series of uh, uh, future projects uh, that involved big or bigger interdisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. And the next slide um, is maybe a good example of that. And I know you've done some of this as well. This yeah. is a, a group shot of an of a team that we were looking particularly at the issue of stem cell research. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to focus on that. As many of you know, it's a controversial area of research, particularly around embryonic stem cells. Uh, and again, we're thinking through how can art maybe articulate more nuanced positions or just raise questions for people. Mm -hmm. And so we brought together a team of artists, bioethicists, um, policy people, uh, science you know, researchers, field mm -hmm. researchers, and we just gathered for a workshop three days, and then, you know, work towards an exhibition and a publication. Mm. Um, and so that's one model we've sort of revisited mm. several times. Because yeah. I, I think, you know, one, one of the problems for the sciences is their inability sometimes to picture concepts. You know, I've always thought that um, adverts on television for Panadol and things like this are always atrocious. Yeah. You know, they, they try and represent pain as, as some morphed archer that is aiming at your heart or something like that. that um, and I think that, you, you know, artists are able to construct much more subtle, complex visual ideas. Yeah, and I think the other thing, of course, they face as a challenge is the tendency for media to, again, kind of polarize some yeah. of what they do, right, and simpl simplify. Mm -hmm. uh, it's either the greatest thing in the world or it's apocalyptic. And so, again, more nuanced, meaningful discussion and kind of get lost. Yeah. And that, this is um, one of your yeah, this collaborators. Is, yeah, this is a new colleague of mine, Marilyn Oliver. Maybe some of you are familiar with her work. She's from the UK originally. Yeah. Uh, and I think I often show this work in, in uh, discussions around research because I think it's a great example of someone working with science to do just what you're saying. Mm -hmm. These, as you maybe know, this work is a family portrait. Um, and this is her whole family put through an MRI and then reprint it on panes of glass and then stack back up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great example of kind of picturing maybe some more complex feelings around technology because they're beautiful on one hand, but also very haunting. Yes. And so you have this very complex reaction to them, right? Yeah. Which I think embodies some of the feelings we have towards mm -hmm. all kinds of technology. Mm -hmm. right? well, I think also they say that they address sort of questions about essence and and you know what is intrinsically the individual. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, and and it really raises complex questions. You know, and I, and I mm -hmm. another one other great thing is it's a great use of print, right? The highest level of imaging technology and then the simplest of stem yeah. right? And bringing mm -hmm. that together. Yeah. And and that you, you included William Hunter, Hunter yeah. yeah, so famous work as well. And I wanted to include this because during the when I was working on the stem cell project, again, obviously given the content, I looked a lot at William Hunter's work, mm -hmm. and it's such this visceral, powerful, difficult work in many ways, right? And sort of like Marilyn, I think, does this mm -hmm. flip where it's, you're compelled by it and also kind of repulsed, right? And, uh, but the other reason I want to show it is, it is a depiction of science in a way that's very visceral, mm -hmm. very, uh, I mean, it's visceral, yeah, mm -hmm. which, um, if you could go to the next slide, as part of the uh, project on stem cell research, I ended up going to a lot of stem cell network conferences. I do this joke every time. Has anyone ever been to a stem cell conference? <laughs> very difficult, right? Like, so I'm very interested in the subject. It's very compelling. Uh, I can understand on some level some of the ethical questions they're raising mm -hmm. with, and some of the simple science, but on another level, it is completely beyond my mm. comprehension, right? This is uh, one of the, I just grabbed this, this was a slide from, from one of the presenters, and it struck me as how different that is to mm. the William Hunter, right? Mm. So we live in this time when 
these really cutting edge uh, technolo technologies are coming along that most of us can't understand on some level. Mm -hmm. And important ethical questions, mm -hmm. important political, important policy questions have to be made, but we're kind of distanced from mm -hmm. uh, some of the understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, I also wonder if there's something else behind that, that, um, you know, as we try to deal with increasingly complex problems, they can't be solved within a single discipline. Mm -hmm. And so if disciplines can't speak to one another, yeah. Yeah. then there is a, a lack of opportunity for engagement. Absolutely, and multiple perspectives, and yeah. one discipline not understanding a problem that another discipline might understand. Mm. And his, this is so. These are a couple. Yeah, yeah, these are a couple of works that I produced from that uh, project. They, they ended up being large-scale mixed-media drawings and screen prints. Mm -hmm. So they're done on drafting film and thinking about a lot of the things we've already talked about: history of anatomy, uh, depictions of the body that are both familiar and unfamiliar. Um, yeah, the next slide is uh, installation shot at the Chelsea Art Museum in New York, and so you can sort of get a sense of how they're. But here, you, you, in a way, you know, you're, you're not representing the, the exterior body. It's very much the interior functions mm -hmm. that you're, um, you know, exploring, and, and that goes through into perceptions of. Uh, so yeah, this problems. was the publication that came from that whole project, yes. and um, but one of my drawings is featured yeah. in this. Um, but yeah, absolutely, in, in these drawings, thinking about the interior of the body, and actually I may be thinking about how foreign that concept that is to us, or mm. how difficult it is to think about our bodies in those terms. Mm. And, and the body then becomes more prevalent in this series of works. Yeah, so um, this is a project, it was called In Your Nations, and um, a colleague who's actually here as well, Professor Stephen Hoffman initiated, he was the lead in the project, and we were uh, looking at the issue of vaccines. So again, another issue that has raised a lot of polarized debate in society. Um, and one of the things I was interested in is um, creating images that drew on this famous uh, Vesalius, uh, which we're all familiar with, as I, and I saw that as a kind of uh, important early scientific anatomical image, and then contrasting, I, I kind of appropriated it, and then made these sort of invented, um, imagined um, ideas of what our body is, and sort of superimposed the two together. And you then take this outside into the street? Yeah, so this, the exhibition um, was actually, and it gets back to some earlier things we were talking about, actually ended up in the UN AIDS building, so this is the interior of UNAIDS, mm -hmm. and the exhibition opened um, at the same time of a uh, World Health Organization assembly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we had a lot of policymakers see the exhibition, uh, you know, they're thinking about global health issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we were really thrilled to be able to do that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, it speaks to cha challenging ways you can bring art to different mm -hmm. uh, zones. And again, printing mm -hmm. is a great way to do that. But again, one of the challenges of that is how do you present work in these unusual spaces and they hopefully can still function. Mm. And so we had planned the exhibition by going to the space first and then coming back and making work. And mm. I was very interested in the grid of the windows and I tried to make the work that responded mm. to that. And, and were there things that um, came of this, that you know, where the policymakers came back to you to, you know, for further collaboration or like yeah, my general sense was that the overall reaction was very positive and that I think, you know, they recognize maybe an opportunity here for art to play a role in, again, dialogue, mm -hmm. that other venue, uh, other mechanisms they were using were failing. Mm -hmm. um, not that it's going to fix everything, not that it's, you know, a silver bullet or anything, but that it's another tool that uh, can open up debate. Yeah. And so it was really positive uh, feedback and actually the work uh, remains at the AIDS now, mm -hmm. so uh, it was a great dialogue um, for certain. So. And <coughs> these last two things, this is just a smaller work I made in, as part of the uh, series, uh, which just thinking about other uh, ways to disseminate uh, ideas ended up in a, a publication 
called the vaccination picture, uh, which was co. Well, my brother wrote it, and then I sort of worked as an art director to yeah, for the work. Sounds like you got quite an illustrious family. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I think um, it would be very nice for you, know, for you to talk through this um, this this epic piece of yours, the, the flood, of a couple of years ago. Um, yes. Can we start with this? Sure. So I just have this image uh, because uh, an interesting thing happened as I was working on this piece um, when it was eventually shown and we'll see it soon, there was actually a massive forge, forest fire in northern Alberta um, in Fort McMurray. And Fort McMurray is a place where this oil sands production happens. So it was quite controversial. It was quite traumatic for a lot of people. In fact, some of my students lost houses. Mm. So it was very interesting to do this work about uh, trauma, Climatic, I kind of traumatic event, and then have this actually mm. event happen. So it charged the discussion of the work in a kind of interesting mm. way. So, mm. yeah. so I mean, in a way, the the the, the, the fire brings a certain urgency to this work. Yeah, and I, it, you know, certainly it happened at the same time. So obviously yeah. it wasn't planned, but it was this. Uh, and I showed this. Uh, well, it's from the English Civil War, so. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to show this because, again, speaking to the woodcut and this really interesting work, I think that the kind of energy of the woodcut, mm -hmm. the rawness of the woodcut, yeah. and how this is attached to the political image uh, and the power of the woodcut. So, again, even though I'm working larger, looking back at historical mm -hmm. works for, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And they're very complex ideas mm -hmm. being thrashed out in this little image, aren't they? Yeah, that's a terrific point. And Complex ideas, but also stated with clarity yeah. and with graphic clarity, yeah. right? and so that's what's so great about. It. I mean, with with uh, woodcut, you it's binary, isn't it? You're either in, it's either in or out. Yes. I, is that something that you really respond to, in, you know, as a, as a kind of discipline? Absolutely. I think it's one of the reasons I'm drawn to print. Mm -hmm. Is this, uh, and I think many many artists creatively why they go to print is this quality of lichen would cut where the material has this mm. kind of response as you're describing. Mm. And for me, uh, I just find that really helpful in terms of mm. drawing and being kind of uh, responsive to image. And in a way, I find that my drawings improve, I think, as opposed to what I'm able to work more fluidly. Yeah. Mm. You can't do that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and then when you do make a mistake, you have to kind of be with it. Yeah, and, and here's your, your plan for... Yeah, so I was, I approached, mm -hmm. I, I want to note that I appreciated the curator, uh, Christine Chernier, at the Art Gallery of Alberta. I, I had planned, it, I proposed a much smaller exhibition, and she said, well, mm -hmm. we could do that, but why don't you make a 22 by 30 foot woodcut? <laughs> okay. <laughs> by Sunday. <laughs> yes, that's right. So this is the initial plan, and I just... Uh, marked it out so it was seven, each of these panels is seven feet by two feet. Uh, and then I just began to just work through the, the process. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, in the studio, uh, working on the blocks, and again, just laying them out on the floor and cutting uh, the image slowly. I didn't, uh, I started with a very small, loose sketch, and then otherwise I just began to carve. I didn't have a kind of plan. And you do this without an e-pads. <laughs> I eventually buy them. <laughs> so Thomas said it's his knees that go first. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. um, and, and then this, these are... So I wanted to share this because this is me working on the piece and uh, I, it was bigger than my studio so I could never see the entire piece. So I'd have to sort of work on the blocks and then kind of move them over and then work on more blocks and move them over. And I never did see the final piece until it was installed, uh, which I think speaks to uh, print as well, mm -hmm. this kind of process-based work, indirect work, and yeah. that, that was happening on a large scale. Yeah, you learn to trust your judgment, don't you? Yeah, and the kind of try to be energized by the fact that you're, you know, yeah. you're not going to see it. Yeah. But did you, uh, so you resolved each block on its own? I would resolve kind of sections. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. And then this is uh, so a drawing from it. 
Yeah, so as I was working, I would, you know, I'm working large scale, but continue to do smaller works, and these are some studies, uh, small ink drawings. And one of the things, maybe you could sense in a lot of my work, is this idea of a, a sort of internal cycle, or mm -hmm. uh, an image that's sort of, or an object that seems to have this, in, this kind of internal cycle. Um, so anyway, I study for the, the bigger work. And then also turning them occasionally into uh, smaller prints. This is a line of cut based on the drawing. And then the... And then there's the final wow. one. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this is not printed. This is the woodblocks themselves. So in a way, you know, you're really dealing with almost fast relief, aren't you? Yeah, so they become, it becomes quite a sculptural uh, thing. And I did print about 60% of it. Mm -hmm. And some of those early paste ups, you might recognize parts of this. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were from parts of this. So part of it was printed, and I did, again, goes back to this idea of it could have multiple mm -hmm. uh, kind of sites. And, and how long did you work on this? So it, the project took about two years. Two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. I, I actually, it's an interesting creative question too, because I think um, it's great when you can think about different paces mm -hmm. in terms of your studio, mm -hmm. and having a project that you know mm -hmm. is going to have this slow kind of yeah. uh, can be rewarding. I think. Yeah, and you just know that there's a certain amount of time yeah. that it's going to take, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, you that's have right. to just accept. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's very interesting. These were. Uh, Detail. This is the detail. So a lot of it was just carved by hand, and a section like this, the house would maybe take um, months and months and a half, and then other parts were done with a grinder, so that would take a couple hours. So again, this idea of pace changing. And, um, did you did you roll up the whole surface for the first of all? Yeah. So that you were then working. Yeah. 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 And then you know. You can still return to it's very intimate. Yeah, smaller work. Mm -hmm. Smaller work. So again, while I'm working on this larger work, um, mm -hmm. coming back to, to smaller work. A bit washed out in this, but um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then we're going to come to this final um, project. This extraordinary photograph. Yeah, so thinking of this, we had the uh, UN, uh, UN Conference on Climate Change in, in our city, so we were asked to do a project, and it was um, primarily students that were involved, but uh, I did also start to make some work for it. And also, I'm involved in a new project called um, Speculative Energy Futures, where we're thinking about energy trans transition. But anyway, for initial work on this, I began to just look at images where I thought about this huge impact on the environment. So many of you maybe know at the end of the Soviet period, mm -hmm. the Soviets began to dump waste in the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, but luckily, you, the work, you know, collectively people are working to bring them up. But I found it to be a very haunting image. Mm -hmm. so. And I think the way you interpret that, I mean, in a way, you almost turn the submarine into some, you know, a tree trunk or, uh, well, a tree trunk. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah, a good example of how looking at images and then translating them. And I guess one thing that we haven't touched on is uh, kind of a role of humor or mm. a certain whimsical quality. Um, you know, dealing with maybe uh, subject matter that's uh, tough, but that you come at it with a language that's somewhat whimsical. Do, do you think you get that from those early woodcuts? You know, because, you know, there's a certain, um, you know, within that kind of folk tradition, there's, there's often a slightly comic yeah. aspect, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and even the one from the English Civil War yeah. has a certain quality of that, right? Yeah. Um, and also graphic novels and that tradition, so maybe yeah. those things are coming together. But it's a useful device in art, I think, to, yeah. to, you know, to draw on you. Of course, well-known uh, image from American nuclear tests. And you've included this, um, uh, yeah, Dora yeah, um, you know, thinking about literature, thinking about the history mm -hmm. of, of uh, 
how people have thought about some of these challenging questions. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're very contemporary, but they're old as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in Dante's work, as you probably all know, this is a moment when there's a ref you know, there's many moments in the story about a real reflection about how do we face suffering in the world, how do we face mm -hmm. conflict, how do we face change. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah. I think also the the rendition of, of the water is in a way like oil. Yes. In this, isn't it? Which you know, in a way, you translate that in your woodcuts. Yeah, yeah. And here's the scent. Yeah. And um, these are some other works from your colleagues who are working on this project as well. Yeah, so the, we did a uh, small publication, and, um, and then, as I say, I wanted to involve students. So that image on the top is an aerial image of the oil sands I was speaking of earlier, and then these are some student work uh, uh, from the University of Alberta, mm -hmm. MFA students who were sort of dealing with questions of environment. Mm -hmm. And, and is, it, is there a kind of a sense that you're working all together um, around these issues, you know, and, and is there a lot of exchange? Oh, for sure. Uh, and especially, you know, working in a print mm. kind of context is great because we're often in the same space, mm. so we're sharing ideas, looking at mm. uh, similar source material. Uh, sometimes we there was workshops where we would actually kind of discuss, mm -hmm. discuss these ideas and go back to the studio. Um, but it, but also, you know, what's great about that is you, you share ideas, but then you come at the, the question from different perspectives, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But also, the, the history of print shops in the past was they were a place of exchange of knowledge, weren't they? You yeah. Know, having so, you know, someone would be printing Bibles one day, pamphlets the next day. You know, there, there was a... Um, you know that that was the reservoir through which ideas went. Absolutely, and yeah. um, of course, also an environment where a lot of political. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was also without prejudice. I mean, you know, because a lot of printers were jobbing printers, so they were just getting. Yeah. 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 And just a few more. Yeah. Last um, group of works that sort of relate to. Yeah. These are very harrowing images, you know. For I mean, there is this slight comic aspect, but they, there's no denying what they're telling us that things are going in the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, um, I've rather monopolised Sean, sure. and. Um, I'd like to sort of throw it open for <coughs> some questions from the audience. And I think we have a roving mic. Oh, we, we have to have a second. Roving mic? Oh, the mic can't work. Sorry. It's a very sad voice. We don't mind if we spot it. If, if you say the question, then I'll speak it back. Basically, it's about the, 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 the change of scale from the very intimate mezzotins to this sort of grand scale where things are being pasted up on the wall, and how Sean negotiated that. Yeah. So, um, I guess I would uh, ask to answer, um, bring back this uh, really wonderful collaboration with the sculptor Roger Mills. Um, because I was collaborating, we're actually making pieces together. I initially was trying to have my small work work with his, and I think we made some relatively successful things, but it never quite worked. Mm -hmm. So on some level, that challenge alone was interesting for me to kind of just try to see what happens. But I think another thing uh, 
was to get back to that dirge, the small you know, the one from the book of Revelation. In a way, I find it easier to go from this to big mm. than from this to this. Mm. It's the hardest thing to yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. But there's something about, you know, when you see a small print and you come up to it, it's sort of expansive. Yeah. And then when you make a big work, it's a similar experience. It's the mid-size work that I yeah. really struggle with. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, I could, I could understand that. Yeah. Uh, questions? Questions about? These impossible stand up people to help them out. <laughs> so, um, I have one about audience because um, I, I'm from the University of Alberta and flew over here to, to support everything. You're very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> question. Um, I guess probably my first instinct was thinking more about my immediate community, but um, I hope that maybe the particular questions we're asking in Alberta have other mm -hmm. manifestations in different communities, right? And so I hope that you don't, you know, that it sort of can function in both places. One of the things that was a diff difficult time for us was, I, you know, my wife's from Japan and living through the Fukushima mm. um, disaster. I mean, that's a different context, but in many ways it's similar uh, questions, right? Mm. So I don't know if that answers it, but I started with the particular, and I hope that it can extend out to other audiences. But, but you set your, um, your dramas within a, a kind of landscape that that could be any number of places. Yeah. You know that they're not sort of topographically correct. Yeah. You know. So I, I think in a way that enables them to operate across a wide range of landscapes. You know. Yeah. So I'm glad you hear that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe that was part of my thinking mm -hmm. in creating it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, that's a great idea, and, and <laughs> <laughs> we should do it. Um, and I, uh, you know, for me, actually, it's interesting. I don't know that we would exactly fight. Mm. I think on many levels, um, we agree. Um, it's just that maybe, you know, when I talk to him, I see, well, for example, recently, oil prices dropped. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people got laid off. It's really difficult. And, you know, so I sort of see that side. And <coughs> and so I guess when I make work, I hope it's not like pointing a yeah. finger. Mm -hmm. It's like, how can we talk through this together? And uh, so I don't know if that answers the question. But I do, I do think your idea is a good one. And I actually think that maybe if I can be critical of, of uh, my community, is maybe we should do more mm -hmm. of what you're suggesting, like mm -hmm. inviting the other side to, uh, to these discussions. Yeah. We had a very um, uh, 
a fascinating presentation last term by Robert Storm, the art critic, who was um, talking about the, I mean, basically how, as a liberal community, how we deal with a post-Trump world. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, that the, the danger is in polarization, yeah. in actually assuming that everyone that voted for Trump is, is a fascist and, you know, everybody else is liberal and things like this. And the only way of moving forward is actually to find common ground. Because otherwise, you, I mean, in this disastrous situation we're in, in the UK over Brexit, there's this um, dreadful sense of there will be winners and losers. Yeah. And how that's going to be negotiated. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I hope that the real art can play. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's other things mm -hmm. we have to do. Um, and the tricky part, of course, too, in doing that, trying to find that middle ground, it's not like you want to abandon a principle mm -hmm. either, right? So that's the. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you also feel that artists are. are um, given permission to go into places that other people d can't. Um, we, we're sometimes allowed to play that role of the fool in Shakespeare, where, mm -hmm. you know, we can say the obvious stupid thing that any, any other courtier would have their heads cut off. But as artists, uh, I think often we're given a lot more leeway. And I think we could use that. Yep, yep. And, and hopefully, yeah, exactly, when the audience sees the work, maybe they feel like they're put in that position too, yeah. Right? Yeah. so I agree. Yeah. Um, although I will say that once I drove up to our oil refineries and tried to take a picture, mm -hmm. and the security truck showed up <laughs> so quickly, I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. So I wasn't allowed into that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. There was some and, and then, yeah, so the back. It's about the, the, the kind of reaction that Sean's work generates. Yeah, and you were asking the ones that I was most excited by? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been diverse, and of course, uh, you're not always sure what the audience is experiencing, but I was once, uh, for some of the early woodcuts, larger woodcuts, um, a person came up to me and said, I work in oil sands, and this feels just like my uh, place of work, and that was very exciting, interesting, because I felt like, yeah. gee, it, we would kind of share. Yeah. Other times, <coughs> I just recently showed a large work in a smaller town in Alberta called Medicine Hat, yeah. and I was speaking to a, a group of uh, younger school kids, yeah. and I was delighted how quickly they um, picked up on the themes and were interested in. Um, but one interesting young student said to me, well, you're talking about environment, but, what, but you're making very big work that's using resources and mm -hmm. people. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the medicine too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was a great question. And, yeah. and it, it, you know, as artists, but in some ways I feel that, that the, the scale that you're prepared to work on in a way becomes some kind of equivalent to the kind of industrial scale you know, that, that you are addressing. That was, ho yeah, that's what I was thinking and hopefully that's and the kind of big scale of the question. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, it was an insightful question. Yeah. 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 Should we take one, one more yeah. question from Gabriella? Yeah. Oh.